Imagine someone you love and trust just told you something related to an event from church history that you've never heard much about before. They seem pretty shocked by what they've heard, and so you decide to do some looking to see what the commotion is all about. You Google search a phrase and find dozens and even hundreds of resources. Or you're about to start your commute to work, or maybe you're sitting down to fold a load of clean laundry and you scroll through to find a good podcast to listen to. Or you just received a new gift from a friend or family member and you open it up to find a new book from Deseret Book about a doctrinal topic you've heard a lot of people talking about recently. The question in each of these scenarios is how do you know what sources to trust? Or how do you know if a gospel or church history resource is reliable and trustworthy at all? Hi, and welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast with Ben Peterson. This show is filled with gospel teachings and personal insights to help answer your heartfelt questions and increase your hope and faith in Jesus Christ. I'm so glad you're listening and sincerely hope you enjoy the show. For many of you, these scenarios are not as hypothetical as they are realistic. With the internet, information that used to be unavailable to most people is now accessible to almost everyone. And in our day, finding answers to questions has really never been easier. When we have questions, we just search online and expect an immediate response. And we often get them. But how often do we stop and think about whether we're asking the right questions or if we're looking at the right resources and if we're even getting the right answers? Today, our problem isn't so much that we have too many unanswered questions. Our problem is that our questions just have too many answers. And more importantly, how can we discern between good and bad information, between what's true and what's only partially true, and what's altogether just wrong or completely made up? Never in the history of the world, said Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, have we had easier access to more information. Some of it true, some of it false, and much of it partially true. Consequently, never in the history of the world has it been more important to learn how to correctly discern between truth and error. That's the end of his quote. Today's conversation about the varying accuracy of available information, particularly information about the gospel of Jesus Christ, is actually what uh, in part led me to produce this podcast. Let me take you back a few years to help give you some context. Uh, Several years ago, I was invited to leave my former position as a seminary teacher for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to join a handful of highly trusted individuals at church headquarters known as Correlation Evaluation. The simplest way to describe our role is that it is our privilege to assist the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in their apostolic responsibility to protect the doctrinal accuracy of the Church of Jesus Christ. With that role, I'm engaged in conversations and reviews of gospel materials every single day. As a pattern, we take our direction from the scriptures and the teachings and most current priorities of the anointed prophets, seers, and revelators that God has called to lead in his church. So as I review materials and information, Part of my job is to carefully ensure that what is being presented by the church is pure and true doctrine, but also to make sure that the truth being presented aligns with the righteous purposes of the Lord as revealed through the scriptures and his holy prophets. Now, there have always been some dissenters from Christ's church and outsiders who choose to attack belief in God. And to be frank with you, until Christ comes again, there will continue to be, as Elder Neil L. Anderson called them, mocking fireballs of annoyed disbelievers. But in recent months, I've noticed more and more a popular and even trendy rise to some content being created, published, distributed, and even sold by individuals and some organizations who likely mean well but are perhaps unaware of the dangerous paths that they walk when it comes to accuracy of doctrine or history. Of course, 
There are some incredible and trustworthy sources out there created by individuals who are solid in their intent as well as in the truth that they present. But there are some, even many, who are not ill-intentioned, but do at times, and more specifically on particular topics, begin to walk down dangerous paths of doctrinal drift. And though what they have to say may seem alluring, attractive, and even harmless, they can at times lead to paths of distraction or doubt. Now, my natural reaction to seeing information like this rise in popularity and in prevalence is really to do nothing. <laughs> it is to go on living my life and doing my best to follow God's prophets. But in my heart, as I saw this taking place more and more, I began to feel a swelling urge to speak up. These words spoken by President Russell M. Nelson in a BYU devotional in 1986 give expression to some of the things that I felt over the last few months. He said, if truth is used by anyone in any degree of unrighteousness, others in the spirit of unity must act, bearing a responsibility to turn and to help enlarge that person's perspective. For if the true and righteous people are silent, those who use truth in unrighteousness will prevail. And Winston Churchill, speaking from his uh, viewpoint in history, said how the malice of the wicked was reinforced by the weakness of the virtuous. How the middle course, adopted from desires for safety and a quiet life, may be found to lead direct to the bullseye of disaster. So I felt a need to act and to speak up. And I felt prompted to begin this podcast. Now, just as a side note, it is out of my typical comfort zone to host a podcast like this. I love to teach the gospel, but speaking into a microphone and not having the chance to look into your eyes is a bit of an overwhelming thing for me to do. So please know and remember that this show is done completely out of love and obedience to God and out of a genuine love for you. It is not about me. Now, going back to our discussion today, how do you know if a source is trustworthy? Elder D. Todd Christofferson explained, quote, In some faith traditions, theologians claim equal teaching authority with the ecclesiastical hierarchy, and doctrinal matters may become a contest of opinions between them. Some rely on the ecumenical councils of the Middle Ages and their creeds. Others place primary emphasis on the reasoning of post-apostolic theologians or on biblical hermeneutics and exegesis. We value scholarship that enhances understanding, but in the church today, just as anciently, establishing the doctrine of Christ or correcting doctrinal deviations is a matter of divine revelation to those the Lord endows with apostolic authority. So if you want to find the most trustworthy sources out there, they're the scriptures and the teachings of God's prophets and apostles. And as supplements to the scriptures and for extra help applying everlasting truth into our life, the church has, under the direction and approval of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, created a vast amount of content that you can easily recognize by the insignia of the church logo and the word mark. All of those materials are carefully created under the direction and counsel of general authorities and general church officers. They're also carefully reviewed and certified prior to being published. Those are among the best sources to use. Now, there's a lot of other sources out there that can also be helpful to use, including this podcast. But how do you navigate the task of determining if they're completely reliable and trustworthy for someone who doesn't want to take a detour off the path of truth and faith. Elder Neil L. Anderson said the internet information does not have a truth filter. Some information, no matter how convincing, is simply not true. And in a general authority training meeting, President Gordon B. Hinckley taught on the subject, keeping the doctrine pure and the church on the right course. He said, we cannot be too careful we must watch that we do not get off course. Now remember, this is two general authorities. In our efforts to be original and fresh and different, we may teach things that may not be entirely in harmony with the basic doctrines of this restored Church of Jesus Christ. 
We had better be more alert, he said. We must be watchmen on the tower. Close quote. So with my experience in my role, I thought it would be valuable to give some tips that if followed will help you and others discern trustworthy and reliable sources in your own quest for truth. I'm going to list these tips in the form of questions that you can ask yourself. The first one should sound pretty obvious, but it can't be overemphasized, is this. What did I feel from the Holy Ghost when I read or heard this information? Remember, that which doth not edify is not of God and is darkness. That which is of God is light. That's a quote from Doctrine and Covenants section 50. So does it confirm what you've already felt the Holy Ghost teach you is true? Or does this new information, does this resource encourage you to doubt gospel truths, even just some gospel truths? When your number one purpose is to come into Christ and receive the Holy Ghost, then we're more concerned with hearing his voice to learn what we need to know to return back to him than we are in being concerned to know what every person's ever had to say about a given topic or teaching. So stay in tune with the Holy Ghost. He can warn you. Does it give you pause? Does it make you kind of just step back and think, wait a second, there's something off here. Let me tell you an experience I had just uh, a few weeks ago. I was at a conference that uh, was centered on gospel teachings. And in this conference, at one point, someone stood up and started saying some things that far more reflected the philosophies of men than it did any scripture or doctrine. And to me, with my background, it was very obvious, but I was curious and worried to know what others thought and if they were discerning this, if they could tell that what was being taught was not accurate in this particular um, speaker's presentation. And so uh, at one point, I was sitting at a table next to a young man. He was 19 years old. And I was asking him what he thought about the conference. And I asked him uh, what his favorite parts are and, and, and if there were any parts that he, uh, that he thought were just interesting. And he said, it's all been great until, and then he named the, the speaker that I was a little nervous about. And he mentioned that he just felt like something was off. And he said, from that point, it's just been kind of uncomfortable for him. And it was really awesome to me to see this young man, 19 years old, with not a lot of experience being steeped in doctrine for decades of his life every single day. And yet the Holy Ghost could speak to him and could help him understand, even with his own limited experience, that something was wrong with what was being said. So stay close to the Spirit. He will direct you. The second question to ask yourself is, does it agree with the scriptures? And is it found in the current teachings and emphases of multiple prophets? Elder Anderson from the Quorum of the Twelve said, the doctrine is taught by all 15 members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. It is not hidden in an obscure paragraph of one talk. True principles are taught frequently and by many. Our doctrine is not difficult to find. That's in October uh, General Conference 2012. So beware of the trendy new topic discussions. It reminds me of a scripture in the book of Acts when Paul was uh, in Rome trying to teach the Romans and they would all gather on Mars Hill wanting to hear some new thing. And speaking of similar instances in our day, Elder Quentin L. Cook taught, I am particularly concerned with foolishness and being obsessed with every new thing. In the church, we encourage and celebrate truth and knowledge of every kind. But when culture, knowledge, and social mores are separated from God's plan of happiness and the essential role of Jesus Christ, there is an inevitable disintegration of society. In our day, despite unprecedented gains in many areas, especially science and communication, essential basic values have eroded and overall happiness and well-being have diminished. That's the end of his quote. So, Remember, academics and historians are expected to publish, and it's good that they do. But remember, if you're going to publish something and you want it to be successful, there can be a lot of pressure on these individuals to publish something exciting and new. So you look for a new angle or a new, or new information that's never been presented before, perhaps a new interpretation. 
Now, it can be completely acceptable to look at something from a new perspective, but you want to be aware that some authors, academics, historians, speakers, podcasters, etc., may create a discussion so that, that, that's exciting and new, but it really revolves around more speculation than anything else. An example of this is the topic of Heavenly Mother. You see this topic rise in popularity today. You see it in podcasts and blogs and books, and it's all over the place. It is a true doctrine, but the articles and books and blogs and podcast episodes out there are by far more speculative in nature on this topic. They take a few quotes that are flying around out there from church leaders, and they build a story based on a lot of speculation and assumption. And if you read what's been said by some, they even begin to present the being of Heavenly Mother as one who could even begin to take on the role of our advocate with Heavenly Father. Some even encourage praying to her, um, de-emphasizing or at least under-emphasizing and distracting from the role of the Father and the need for Jesus Christ, who is our Redeemer and is our only mediator with the Father. So watch carefully. If a resource sticks to what we do know and aligns with the doctrinal teachings of the prophets and the scriptures and avoids getting ahead of the Lord's anointed prophets and emphasizes the role of Christ and leads us to come unto him, the scriptures are called the standard works for a reason. They're a standard against which all other teachings are measured. So beware of other sources that might take a doctrinal conversation further than the scriptures do, or further than the prophets, whose holy calling it is to declare doctrine. Another question to ask yourself about resources is this. Is the doctrine or viewpoint presented in a balanced way? This is important. Once again, in an effort to start a more exciting discussion, some people become tempted to lean too far in one direction. An example of this would be a focus on Christ's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane as being the, the uh, most important or, maybe, or possibly even the only part of his atonement, leaving out the essential element of what took place on Calvary, on the cross, and the crucial role that that played in our ability to be made free from sin through a spiritual rebirth. Now watch for an upcoming episode on that topic, by the way, on the topic of the Savior's atonement. Another example of this could be the discussion regarding the Book of Mormon translation. Some like to focus a lot on the use of a seer stone, which is something that we didn't emphasize very much in the past. And it's true that it was used, but in doing so, you see an imbalance in a lot of places where they focus uh, exclusively on the use of the seer stone and they leave out or very, very under... Um, uh, emphasize the use of the Urim and Thummim, which is what the Prophet Joseph Smith and Heavenly Father used. Uh, another example of this could be the discussion regarding the Book of Mormon translation, where a lot of people nowadays like to focus almost exclusively on the use of a seer stone, um, as Joseph was translating the Book of Mormon. And they either underemphasize or completely leave out the idea that the Urim and Thummim was used and provided for, for that purpose. And remember that Joseph and the Lord uh, exclusively used the, the term Urim and Thummim um, uh, rather than seer stone. And so another example of this could be the discussion regarding the Book of Mormon translation, whereas some, in fact, Many nowadays like to emphasize almost exclusively the use of a seer stone as Joseph translated. But remember that Joseph never spoke specifically of a seer stone in the translation of the Book of Mormon. Rather, he used the phrase interpreters or Urim and Thummim, and the Lord also used those same phrases. So um, to completely lay, lay aside the uh, mention of the Urim and Thummim would be an imbalanced approach to that. So you want to make sure as you're reading things that you're looking for those balances. And even if you're using a source that doesn't balance it appropriately, you want to make sure that in your mind you're trying to maintain the right balance so you don't uh, get kind of um, a little bit off in your focus or your understanding of how things actually took place or how things are and whether that's doctrine or church history. So you also see imbalance, uh, doctrinally speaking, 
when an author or presenter is trying to place a very strong emphasis on a certain point. A lot of times when we do this, we'll use uh, phrases and we speak in such a way that we end up actually discounting, ignoring, or completely repudiating another point that is at least as important, if not more important, than the point we're trying to make. In fact, I saw this on social media just a couple of days ago. Uh, someone who I respect in the Latter-day Saint community um, had posted something. They were trying to make a very strong point about a particular topic in this uh, meme that they had posted. But in doing so, they actually renounced true doctrine um, and something that's actually a little bit more important than the point they were making, doctrinally speaking. Uh, they completely ignored that and actually spoke against it um, in order to make the point they were trying to make. So we have to be cautious about how we do that um, and we maintain balance. It's really important. Another question to ask yourself is, is this resource focused on the foundational principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And is it bringing me closer to Jesus Christ and his church? Does it promote faith or does it suggest, promote, or reinforce doubt? Um, is it encouraging you to keep God's commandments? Once again, the purpose of our life is to grow in truth and light so we can receive the Holy Ghost and come unto Christ. If the way some information is presented encourages doubt rather than faith, it can be poisonous to our purpose of learning truth in the first place. So uh, remember that uh, the most important things should be emphasized. Um, and, uh, and doubt is just, it just poison. It's the opposite of faith. And uh, we have a whole other episode on that. If you want to look back on that one, it's a great, a great listen. Another question to consider is, does the resource reinforce the idea that the prophet of God is his mouthpiece on the earth? Or does it encourage the thought that perhaps prophets may not always be speaking as prophets? Uh, there's somewhat of an intellectual trend that I've noticed among some, including groups of church members, to encourage doubt, particularly doubt of God's prophets. And this is generally the case when a specific doctrine or teaching does not align with the social or political opinions of, of a particular person or a group. Elder Neil L. Anderson said, if you have a question about counsel from the leaders of the church, please discuss your honest concerns with your parents and leaders. You need the strength that comes from trusting the Lord's prophets. And Harold B. Lee, president of the church, said, the only safety we have as members of this church is to learn to give heed to the words and commandments that the Lord shall give through his prophet. There will be some things that take patience and faith. You may not like what comes. It may contradict your political views, your social views, interfere with your social life. But if you listen to these things as if from the mouth of the Lord himself, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you. That's a powerful promise from a president of the church and a prophet, seer, and revelator. So uh, remember uh, to listen and, and believe and follow the prophet, even if you think that they're mistaken, even if you think that, that it just doesn't match up with what you think is right or what you feel is right. Um, you can always know that you're going to be safe with the prophet. God will, will justify all their words, and that's his promise. Elder Anderson also said, and this is great. Some of you have heard this before. In 1982, two years before being called as a general authority, Brother Russell M. Nelson said, I never ask myself, when does the prophet speak as a prophet and when does he not? My interest, President Nelson said, has been how can I become more like him? And then he added, my philosophy is to stop putting question marks behind the prophet's statements and put exclamation points instead. Remember, that was spoken in 1982. That was before he was a, a general authority or a, a member of the Twelve. So remember the Lord's promise that whether it's by his own voice or the, by, by the voice of his servants, it is the same. So uh, be very, very, very cautious of resources that even slightly promote the idea that prophets are not God's mouthpiece on the earth and that what prophets say can be taken lightly or can be cherry-picked what we like and what we don't like to believe about what prophets say. Um, you may not agree with them, but stand behind them and you will always be safe. Now, another question to ask is, are the teachings 
and events addressed in this resource presented in the proper context of their time, place, and circumstance. This is vital. This is a huge one. Is the right context being presented? Is the full context being presented? Now, some teachings and historical events can become confusing when they're taken out of the context of their time and place. And to be honest, when you're studying church history, your own understanding of the world and of life and society already puts you at a disadvantage. You may have, may have heard the adage by the English novelist L.P. Hartley. He said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. It's true. When you study church history and the events of the 19th century or even the ancient world, it is important not to make rash judgments or assumptions that they knew everything that you do today or that their customs and society were even close to what you're familiar with today. Beware of those authors and presenters who do, who do make those assumptions and those judgments. Um, it happens far too often. In fact, most antagonistic material uh, against the church using church history events are they, they, they actually break this rule of context. They take everything out of context. They, they leave out par parts of the truth. It's partially true. It's lacking uh, the full story, and they twist it to make it look um, what it, like what it's not. They're calling good evil, and they call evil good. Just a fulfilling prophecy. So all the circumstances, all of the circumstances surrounding a particular historical event are not always completely known and are often difficult to record with complete accuracy. And they're skewed a lot of times by the interpretation of the author of the source that you're looking at. So remember that information is always presented with a certain degree of subjectivity and bias. For example, this podcast comes from a faith bias. This, everything is biased by the person presenting it, and my bias is faith. I'm hoping to promote faith in Christ because I know that he's real and because I know that he is the way back home. And so uh, you want to make sure that the bias matches with your bias, or at least be cautious of the bias that the author has so that uh, you don't get deterred from uh, and, and, and tricked into believing everything they say when only part of it's true. Um, so Elder Neil A. Maxwell once said, some insist upon studying the church only through the eyes of its defectors, like interviewing Judas to understand Jesus. Defectors will always tell us more about themselves than about that from which they've departed. It is unfortunate, but true, that some people teach things that are not true, or present them in a way, and that's more, more prevalent today, present them in a way that seems plausible, but that are actually false. Elder Maxwell goes on to say, Korohor was deceived by the devil, and he confessed, I've taught his words, and I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. And I taught them even until I had much success in so much that I verily believed that they were true. And for this cause, I withstood the truth. This reminds me of a story that uh, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf shared in one of his uh, talks at General Conference called The Six Men of Indostan. If you remember, in this story, you have six men who are blind and they all approach an elephant. And because they're blind and they only grab onto one part of the elephant to try to identify what it is that they're, that they're uh, standing in front of, each man interprets the elephant as something different. One interprets it to be a rope, one a tree, and, and, and so forth. A snake was, I think, one of the interpretations. And all of the men gave their own separate interpretation that were all different from each other, but none of them were correct because all of them were taking it out of context. When you feel the ear, or you feel the, the trunk, or you feel the tail, or you feel the, the leg or the tusk of these, uh, of these parts of a, an elephant, you'll never understand what the full elephant is because you're only seeing part of it. Um, and so we have to remember that if we're taking things out of context, they're going to look different and it's going to sound like it's accurate. They, these men in this story believed that they were all right. Um, but they were all wrong. And so we have to remember that context is extremely vital when you're looking at, uh, at church history or any, any type of history or scripture. So take, for example, sources that report Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage, who report at times that Joseph married a 14-year-old young woman. They might present this only minimal fact 
without necessary context in an effort to mislead and cause you to make false assumptions. They might even present assumptions with their presentation about the prophet of God. For example, they might leave out important facts like these. Though Joseph's marriage to 14-year-old Helen Mark Kimball was uncommon, it was not considered scandalous during that time. Others, including Illinois Governor Thomas Ford, married girls who were 15 years old. They may also leave out mention of evidence that indicates that Helen's father was the one who arranged for his daughter to be sealed to the prophet, and that evidences indicate that their relationship was not consummated. Both Helen and her parents had agreed to that sealing, and Helen continued afterward to live and work in her parents' home, taking care of her family. So, less reliable sources may even also fail to present plural marriage and other topics within the, the divine context as revelation to a prophet of God and a, as a restored truth from ancient time. They might also leave out details of a marriage as being one only for this life versus a ceiling for eternity and so many other details regarding plural marriage that we don't have time to discuss in this particular episode. So uh, to avoid being like the blind men in the poem and that story of the six men of Indostan, study things out to ensure that you are seeing things in the appropriate context. Look at the whole elephant rather than making a false, foolish, accusatory assumption based on only one small piece of the history taken completely out of its context. And when you read or listen to other sources, make sure they have done the same. Joseph F. Smith, president of the church, simply said, It is very unwise to take a fragment of truth and treat it as if it were the whole thing. So remember, when you're reading into more details of church history on a topic that you may have not, not studied in depth before, and you find some details to be different from what you assumed previously, Remember to be humble enough to be willing to change your thinking rather than get offended or feel betrayed because your assumption or someone else's assumption was incorrect or uninformed or simply because you'd never taken the time to study the topic in detail before. Now, an another couple of questions to consider uh, as you look at resources is, uh, does the author intentionally ignore available evidence in order to mislead? Uh, some authors deliberately omit important facts, and they ignore critical evidence to support their own particular point of view. Uh, another question is, what are the qualifications, intentions, and possible biases of the author? President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency taught that we should be cautious about the motivation of one who provides information. Our personal decisions should be based on information from sources that are qualified on the subject and free from selfish motivations. Um, how closely, this is another question, how closely connected is the author or the source to the events that are being described? When a source addresses something from church history, ask yourself how far removed the source is from the event it's discussing. And remember that sources based on second or third hand accounts are often far less reliable. And uh, another question is, are the teachings and events supported by additional reliable sources? That's just kind of obvious. Support from other reliable sources can really help establish the accuracy of doctrine and historical events. Um, one last thing to say um, about, about this is um, what to look for when you're looking at resources is the agenda of, of the author or the presenter. What are they hoping to do? Are they hoping, and this is kind of interspersed within a lot of the other questions we asked earlier in this podcast, but, but are they hoping to help present truth, to help you understand things, to lead you to the, to the Savior? Are they hoping to, to twist the truth or to present only part of the truth to prove a point or to, uh, to get you to leave or to justify their own choice to leave the church or justify their anger? that they were frustrated because they'd always assumed something was a certain way and they found out it was different and they felt betrayed and they're trying to justify that, that frustration that they feel. Um, of course, we don't judge people, but we do need to judge um, the things that we take into our, into our mind and into our soul. So um, make sure that you're careful with sources. Some of them, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the Holy Ghost. Some things, they look so comfortable and they feel so good to, to listen to because they feel good to the, to the natural man. Um, a lot of societal and social issues right now uh, are the same, 
but there is truth out there that's being taught, but it's just being intermingled, as you know, with philosophies of men, with, with false um, assumptions and false understandings, or even just uh, misunderstandings of doctrine. In fact, I just was looking at uh, a post on social media earlier today um, of uh, uh, someone who, who I, I love and respect, and and they, made, they were trying to make some great points, but in the process of trying to make these really valid points, they presented some ideas that are actually, they're mistaken views. And it's so easy to become confused in this world. So pay close attention to the Spirit. Be close to the Spirit so that you can hear Him when He speaks to you. Um, as you're, And ask the question. Don't just read something and assume it's correct. And, and definitely don't read something and assume it's correct because you purchased a Desert book. Um, uh, the, the things that sold the Desert book, uh, many people may not know this, but they're not correlated by the church. They're not certified as true doctrine. In fact, you'll notice that there's a disclaimer in, in many of those books that say that they're not the views of the church. They're the views of the author. Remember that. <laughs> just because it's sold by Desert book does not mean that it's filled with 100% uh, pure and true doctrine. And so uh, just be careful. Be careful and know that the Lord will guide you as, as you seek out your truth. And remember to stay close to the words of prophets. Um, and remember to think about the question, what would the, the church leaders say about the information that I'm reading Is it and, and the way it's presented? Is it truth and is it being presented to, to fulfill the righteous purposes of the Lord? Now, not all answers uh, to your questions will come immediately. This is Elder Neil L. Anderson. But most questions can be resolved through sincere study and seeking answers from God. Faith never demands an answer to every question but seeks the assurance and courage to move forward, sometimes acknowledging, I don't know everything, but I do know enough to continue on the path of discipleship. Immersing oneself in persistent doubt fueled by answers from the faithless and the unfaithful weakens one's faith in Jesus Christ and the restoration. That's the end of his quote, and I'll add, immersing yourself in doubt also destroys your ability to feel true joy and your uh, chances for eternal life as you diminish your faith in Christ. So we must realize we're at war. The war began before the world was and will continue. President Russell M. Nelson said, the forces of the adversary are extant upon the earth. All of our virtuous motives, if transmitted only by inertia and timidity, are no match for the resolute wickedness of those who oppose us. Every individual associated with this church should think, speak, and write throughout the world in consonance with this proverb, for my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing perverse in them. That's from Proverbs 8, 7 and 8. Oh, my friends, I love you. I, I wish you all the best in your quest for truth as you study and, and look for additional resources from time to time. If you ever have questions about specific resources, you're welcome to reach out to me on social media. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I can certainly help you find answers uh, to questions and, uh, and know that this uh, podcast episode was done out of love for you and, and really out of an, uh, a feeling and, and a prompting to, to try to help guide us all in in following the Lord's path and not getting lost in the vast amounts of information that are out there today. So uh, if you feel that this topic is uh, is going to be good and helpful for a friend of yours, definitely send it to them. Um, tell them about the podcast, and I hope that you enjoy this episode and uh, that you tune in for our next episode next week. Thanks for listening in today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can listen to more by subscribing to this podcast. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Peterson. Remember, there's always hope in Christ.